Good afternoon and welcome, welcome and greetings to everybody uh, who are attending this webinar. A very special day for us to celebrate World Patient Safety Day. So CAHO has collaborated with CJTRCL and Zubinish in having this Industry Connect program, which is basically meant for creating awareness, awareness on medication without harm. 17th of September is called World Patient Safety Day. WHO has called world over the nations to celebrate this day with the theme of medication without harm. Now, today, we are taking this message from CAHO to, to the industries, basically to connect with the stakeholders. And industries is a very important stakeholder when, we, when it comes to medication without harm. Today, we have this webinar with very special panelists and the moderator. This particular webinar is focused in achieving the understanding on medication without harm from the perspective of people. So we have Kiran ID, Chief People Officer, representing the HR fraternity from Kin Fintech. We have um, the perspective of manufacturer, how at the manufacturing stage, a drug company can, through green chemistry, bring in the protection of the environment. Mr. Srinivasu from Dr. Reddy is sharing with us on that. We, we also have Dr. Sandeep, who is the princip senior principal a scientist from CFTR in Mysore, who will be sharing with us on this objective of how to protect or how environment is actually getting damaged as of today from uh, the excess medication that is that we are doing or uh, how this environment is to be taken care. The food that we eat, how it is contaminated, he will bring the complete stats in the research field. We have Dr. Alex to share with us the medication perspective from a doctor's perspective. And we have a moderator, special moderator today, uh, Dr. Kumaran from Hyundai Chief Medical Officer, who is going to take us through the whole session. And greetings once again to all of you. I would take this special opportunity to invite Dr. Anuradha Pichmani, who is the Executive Director of Sriranga Hospital. She is the chairperson, chairman of Quality Professionals Division of uh, CAHO. Ma'am, welcome you and welcome the address, please. Thank you, Kirti. Hello, everybody. It's my uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to this gathering here. And on behalf of CAHO, it's, uh, it's my immense, uh, I am very pleased to uh, see you all here. And uh, to introduce CAHO to our new uh, people here. So I would like to uh, tell you CAHO is the Consortium of Accredited Healthcare Organizations. And it is a not-for-profit not for body. We represent various uh, divisions of the healthcare, like uh, hospitals, diagnosis centers, and quality professionals. We have three wings uh, of CAHO. And the main aim of starting CAHO was to promote uh, patient safety, quality, and accreditation. So these are the three pillars under which uh, all of us worked uh, with our passion. And uh, moving on, uh, we have uh, various uh, training programs which we have been running across India. And uh, many of these training programs, have, we have taken it as on virtual mode. And uh, uh, some of the training programs are endorsed by international bodies also. So these training programs uh, touch every grassroots level worker within the healthcare system, be it the doctor or the nurse or the CSSC technician, lab technician. So we teach them the standards which have to be followed within the healthcare system. And uh, through CAHO, we have uh, done various uh, quality movement, capacity building activities, research activities. We have a student pink uh, uh, group, which is headed by, uh, again, uh, Dr. Shweta, Keithi, and others are part of that group. We uh, have uh, uh, promoted accreditation across industries. And uh, we have been running various national level conferences. Our uh, signature conference is the CAHOCon. And I welcome you all to participate in the upcoming conference, which is in 2023. The dates are 15th and 16th April, which is uh, happening in Hyderabad. And uh, we have uh, various uh, lab conferences also. And we have our Kahotech, which is uh, going to happen on uh, in September, last week, 22nd to 24th September. This is a technology related conference where we bring in uh, various innovations. We have uh, Pitch Fest, uh, which, has which is happening now in IIT Mumbai. And uh, we have the technology group with the industry, which uh, come and partner in all these uh, innovations. 
And again, we have a separate conference for lab. We, it's called the Kaho LabCon. And uh, these are the various programs. And then we have various trials with our international bodies. Kaho uh, is, uh, has an MOU with the International Society for Quality. And again, Kaho is, uh, is represented on board in ASQA, the Asian Society for Quality. So we work with these international organizations on various platforms. We, have, we are running various international webinar series so that we bring the quality people to come into India and uh, the latest on quality and safety is being shared. The knowledge is being shared on this platform. Again, uh, so coming to this World Patient Safety Day, I'm very happy to see Kaho is partnering with all the stakeholders. And this shows the interest with which you are into the safety and quality, uh, be it the manufacturing industry or the industries from env for environmental safety. And we appreciate each and every one of you who have joined here today and uh, to show, uh, to show your, your work on quality and safety. And I uh, hope you will have a very interesting session. This uh, World Patient Safety Day is uh, mainly on medication safety, which you will be knowing more about this medication safety, how we are going to give medication without harm, where we are talking about uh, patient engagement, the public engagement, uh, other service partners uh, who will help us to improve the medication safety. So uh, the, we, I invite all of you to join hands in this uh, uh, main group of, for medication safety. I will now like to hand it over to back to Ms. Kirti to take the proceedings forward. Over to Kirti. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for giving us an insight about FAHO and the activities that is being conducted. And uh, now taking it uh, further, I would invite Dr. Shweta Prabhakar who is the Zonal Chairman, North Zonal Chairman of uh, CAHO, and she's also the Chairperson of the Student Research Mentoring Program from Focus Mohali. Uh, Dr. Shweta, kindly introduce the moderator. Thank you, uh, Kirti, and uh, thank you, Kaho, for giving me the opportunity to interact with the industry on the uh, topic, which is, you know, now worldwide, we are talking about medication safety. So uh, this is a wonderful platform, um, Kirti, for introducing the industries uh, and from the other, uh, you know, other industry, other, other than the healthcare. It's a wonderful platform. I really appreciate and congratulate for taking this initiative together with your team. Uh, so uh, now without, you know, um, you know, wasting time, I would just invite our moderator for the session. So uh, we have a wonderful panel, uh, panelist uh, on board and uh, so the moderator and uh, Dr. Uh, Kumran uh, is uh, the, you know, he's actually the chief medical officer at Hyundai Motors and he's, uh, you know, been a little, lot of uh, three decades of experience of uh, healthcare experience on his, uh, you know, uh, sleeves. And that's, that makes it uh, all the more, you know, uh, enriching experience what he has gathered amongst the, you know, uh, you know, stakeholders where he's, you know, helping uh, also, uh, you know, the industries uh, and handling their health. So along with the health, obviously the medication goes side by side. So we would invite Dr. Kumran uh, from the industry to moderate the panelists and the discussion to take this discussion forward. He is uh, faculty and is also associated with a lot, uh, you know, affiliations with a lot of, uh, you know, societies. So uh, that's, that's his interest area. So I see a, a real, you know, passionate academician uh, on board also. So probably that will also, uh, you know, please enlighten us uh, with uh, some of your uh, research studies and uh, your uh, passionate uh, areas along with the, the moderation. So over to you, Dr. Kumran. Thank you for giving us uh, the opportunity to be on the board. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, very good morning. Thanks for those nice uh, words. Uh, and in fact, it is a wonderful session on doing no harm uh, with medication to the patient. I think uh, Hippocrates both also when we take, we do not do any procedure or any intervention which causes harm to the patient. That is the fundamental of any medical practice. But off late, uh, in the press and media, we find hospital violences. The reason is because of lack of communication or because of judgmental errors or medication errors. And of course, our forensic book thoroughly says about uh, vicarious liabilities, product liabilities, medical negligence, all these things are there. There were days when doctors, medical practitioners, 
were worshipped as gods. But now the situation is slowly changing. And of course, being in industry, uh, we had stringent uh, accreditations. Like initially we had ISO 9000 for quality. Then we had ISO 14001 for environment management systems. Then we had WOSHAS, occupational health and safety. Now that is changed to ISO 45001, which incorporates occupational health and safety. It's difficult to have three, four audits in a year or five, six audits of various specialties. So got integrated, we face integrated management system, which also includes the energy audit. The doctor patient relationship is purely based on the trust and the outcomes. Of course, the doctor cannot be held responsible for any outcome, therapeutic outcome, but we are in the era of evidence-based medicine. When we take up this ISO, 45, ISO 14,000 environment management system, the expired medicines come under hazardous material and Tamil Nadu pollution, um, pollution control boards have developed norms of disposal of the expiry medicines. And of course, the manufacturer of the medicines is responsible for the safety and efficacy of the drugs. But of course, our paramedical staff needs to be trained and we have to communicate clearly to the patient. My mentor, my professor used to, used to mold me, always write a prescription, whether it is capsule, whether it is a tablet, whether it is a syrup, whether it is a suspension, how much you are giving, supposed to give, whether it's before food or after food, how many times a day or when required. And we have to calculate the dosage as per the body weight, whether it is paracetamol is 10 milligram per kg body weight or 15 milligrams per kg body weight or when required. Of course, there are problems with fixed dose combinations also. When you require a higher dose of a fixed dose, you need to add one more where the titration of the drugs becomes impossible. And we need to educate patients about the mode of usage. And of course, Making a patient swallow one gram or 1.5 grams of a tablet, it's really a punishment. A child, given a suspension, is palatable. A syrup is nauseating. You find it a duty of a pediatrician to educate what is 2.5 ml, what is 5 ml, what is one tablespoon, what is one teaspoon, what is one dessert spoon. That's all very, very important. I was talking to a lab technician uh, what is this? You have written uh, 100 mg per DL. What is DL? He's saying density liter. Density liter. The units are very, very important. So all these things require a teamwork, proper education, understanding of the fundamentals, everything. And I have been running almost 25 years of industry practice. So far, I have not faced any major side effects because I'm very choosy about drugs. Never ever I have prescribed a penicillin, sulfur group of drugs in my practice, and even tetracycline or doxycycline for that matter. And we are very choosy. I have never used an oily based injection. I have never used other than snap break ampules. And we conduct first week, every first week, the FIFO policy, first in, first out policy will meticulously followed. And uh, experiment dates are being monitored. So we have stringent norms. And thanks to this IMS audit, Integrated Management System, where it makes sure uh, that all these things are in line and there is a check system. People are properly trained. Training records are kept, uh, which ensures a doctor a peace of mind so that he can concentrate on patient's recovery and a good therapeutic outcome. Uh, and we have to clearly understand the era of treating doctors as God's is over. Uh, and now it is more of a medical legal practice, more prone for litigation. And we have to be very cautious and very, very cautious. You know, gross negligence will be prescribing an NSAID without a proton pump inhibitor for a patient with the, um, the bleeding gastric ulcer. It's a gross medical negligence. And one more important thing uh, earlier, we used to have the pregnancy safety index in medicine, all the medicines. 
first trimester and second trimester it is called category a b c d uh, and uh, teratogenic or embryocidal effect of the drugs are classified into d and x but uh, fda recently has announced any drug should contain pregnancy lactation labeling index so that is also very very important you know it will be very very detrimental when you give in a first trimester without assessing the proper history and taking clinical findings for uh, fever and you give them a tetrogenic drug it is very detrimental uh, so fda has clearly said uh, pregnancy lactation labeling index so all these are very very important uh, and we have to be very choosy very careful in prescri- the art of prescription is very very important it's more ethical issues and we have to concentrate more on quality quality ensures good outcomes less because prevention is better than cure as well as cheaper than cure so the outcomes are good uh, and definitely the quality of life is also good for the patient it's a win win situation for the doctor and the patient uh, with this uh, brief uh, introduction it's a wonderful session uh, let us listen to the panelist and we have got wonderful panels all experts in the field i am happy um, we have uh, madam kiran adi the chief uh, people officer uh, from kfin technologies private limited hyderabad madam as i was talking to you yesterday hr people are the true people who in fact bring up the true potential of the people because we are working in industries i know the role of hr people the amount of training programs they conduct to the particularly the soft skills development the counseling programs the post graduate nomination programs uh, performance appraisal programs uh, meetings everything really brings out the true potential of the people the job rotation everything you actually play a role of a very good mentor shaping up the career of an individual as well as the life of an individual so as you rightly put in your profile tiny push and a dainty dose of encouragement and a dash of coaching help people rediscover themselves and what and do what they thought was impossible and i believe this little nudges i appreciate uh, and fortunately like doctors you do only good for people except in administration as a hr person you do activities which are only good for the patient in shaping up a career we would like to listen to you about uh, your experience uh, on this uh, quality healthcare and do no harm to the patient in your industrial or um, your uh, office working colleagues over to your thoughts madam now the platform is yours thank Welcome. you yeah thank you so much mr kumaran for introducing me so nicely really appreciate and thank you kaho for giving me this opportunity and dr kirti disuza uh for getting me here uh, thank you so much and i know uh, thanks for your patience uh, ms kirti on for me um so so from an industry standpoint right i'll i'll talk from an employee perspective and an employer perspective both so what really an employee thinks right uh why why do we have this whole you know dilemma of self medication while we know also that it's not good we also know uh, you know that it there are some medicines which will really really harm us but we still go ahead and do self medication and from an employee perspective couple of reasons why they go for self medication are like they don't get time so they don't get time to get up from their you know uh, from their now the people have coming back to office but two years ago it was work from home so they really don't find time actually to go to the doctor and uh, uh, and they they really fail and then what happens is there is a whole lot of knowledge that is available to them free so you have to just go google and google auntie google doctor will tell you everything right plus we plus is an employee right the employees also get into that mode of uh, self assessment of their own symptoms and then self medication also so that is a very dangerous thing to do right they know that it is dangerous but come covid covid taught us everything uh, we all became half doctors at home 
and uh, i was just you know before this webinar i was just reading you know what kind of effects does it have or what how how much of self medication have we done during covid so i was just going through some uh, research called gravitas and they said that you know these days what is our favorite snack and i was just thinking what is it bujia or samosa or what is it right they said it's dolo 650 <laughs> we have taken it as a snack 3.5 billion dolos have been consumed in india in last couple of years it is if you just to stack everything together is 63000 times more than burj khalifa and 6000 times more than mount everest so that is the extent of you know self medication that has gone in now we have all been used to doing anti allergens cold cough headache sprains harm you know uh acidity antacid medicines and everything but now we also went into amoxicillins of the world and limsies of the world and suddenly you would see that people are actually consuming even antibiotics so my my prescription of covid is you know as same as your prescription of covid so this is what when i when at my home when my husband got covid and we were actually looking at you know what are the medicines to give i got up teen number of whatsapp messages with their prescriptions give this give this give this give this right so we all went into that mode of you know giving uh, more and more as an employer right the challenge that we face uh, vis a vis the industry is that there is no category of over the counter drugs in our country so even if i have to tell an employee you know that this is not a good thing to do or this is not something that you know you should be uh, looking at or you should be definitely visiting a doctor our chemist also double up as doctors i have stomach ache okay i go to the chemist and ask okay what medicine can i take for stomach ache okay sir ye le lo what medicine can i take for ear pain okay and i always tell my employees i always tell people you know guys we land up treating symptoms probably that little bit of heart burn that you get on a regular basis is a, is a symptom of that you getting a heart attack sooner or later but because we keep on killing the symptoms with self medication we actually do not get to the root of the problem now if you see as an employer i see when we put our employees through an annual checkup lot of ailments come out there because all through the year we are controlling our ailments through the box that we have in our house most of us will have a big box forget the government first aid box our home boxes are bigger than that and it will have everything right from like i said right from antacids to brufins of the world and ibuprofen got i don't know got banned or something so now people have moved to dolo and combiflams so i remember earlier we used to have i ibuprofen and even from an antibiotics right i was just again reading another study and they said that in india in 2019 Sixteen thousand two hundred and ninety doses of antibiotics were sold in India, and it's like you know, it's like too much, right? And then we don't we we as a as an industry, we are not aware of all these things. Nobody tells us also. Nobody tells us that an antibiotic can create a reaction to you, which can cause an antibiotic resistance, and then you actually when you go to the doctor, nothing works on you. so more and more what kaho is doing right more and more of information more and more of creating awareness for the patients in the industry it's extremely extremely important so these are a few uh, you know uh, pointers that i had in my mind which i thought you know i should i should share and uh, thanks to lot of online platforms that have come up now uh where we can actually go and talk to the doctors etc so that has really helped and i'm hoping that you know with affordability of healthcare uh, you know and more awareness uh, uh, employees will be safer and so would be the employers and we would be able to encourage our people actually to go to the doctors rather than doing self medication over to you mr kumar yeah thank you madam uh, in fact as you rightly said in second wave of covid there was shortage of beds shortage of oxygen and third wave there was no oxygen and in the fourth wave nobody is going to the hospital they do an rt pcr 
find it to be positive, they interpret the CT value. My infection is mild, moderate, severe based on CT value. So CT value says it is uh, uh, 36. I am a very mild case. Whereas if you see the ICMR and Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, COVID treatment protocol, oxygen saturation from 90 to 94 is moderate, 89 and below is severe. That is what the classification says. But people interpret with the CT value of the RT-PCR, which was later declared by ICMR that it is no more an interpretation of the clinical severity of the disease. So self-medication is becoming more. I do not know if they don't have any running nose, there is no necessity to, uh, to take uh, Montelukas and Levocetrizin. So they follow somebody else's prescription. They follow his family member's prescription, self-medicate. The trend is that in the fourth wave, nobody has gone to the hospital. No doctor consultations. This is a sorry state of affairs. And as Madam said, for a stomach pain, if they go to the medical shop and take an antispasmodic, it will be a grave, life-threatening condition. Whenever we take doctors or paramedics for our uh, medical center, when we conduct interview, we ask them what are the quadrants of abdomen, nine quadrants of abdomen. I ask them, what if the patient has severe pain in the right hypochondrium or the right when they reply, it is an appendicitis or a cholecystitis which requires an emergency hospitalization and surgery if necessary. We cannot afford to miss acute appendicitis or acute cholecystitis or even pancreatitis, which will be life-threatening. So when they go to a, a medical shop, there is no regulation. In USA, you cannot buy a Schedule H drug by just like that over the counter. It is not possible. Whereas in India, you can buy any antibiotic, you can buy any antispasmodic. It is not regulated. So that is the problem. The Schedule H drug cannot be bought like that over the uh, counter. So it will be like, it will be more harm to the patient when they have appendicitis or a cholecystitis or a pancreatitis and when they take a uh, over-the-counter medicine for the stomach pain. So it requires a clinical examination. The clinical acumen of a physician to diagnose and then advise investigations accordingly. As you rightly said, Madam, OTC is a very bad idea. Uh, and apart from that, uh, the self-medication, which we have seen during our COVID fourth wave, after RT-PCR, they are all right. They'll stay at home for a week, no doctor consultation, nothing. And one more very uh, sorry state of affairs, in the second wave and third wave, People who are not investigated for CRP level or D-dimer levels following a COVID infection. The thrombotic state has caused a paralytic stroke or a heart attack. For some of them, it is permanent disability throughout the life. The thrombotic state of COVID uh, has caused a paralytic stroke in the brain uh, and uh, they are having a disability in the life. So this is a very dangerous trend. And uh, of course, I educate patients I educate patients, we tell them to take, uh, go to a doctor, get the clinical side, tell that you, and Googling is very, very too much now. When they have an electrical problem, they meet an electrician. When they have an architect or a lawyer, they go. But for health issues, they Google it, take one treatment. And when they come to the doctor, they say, this is the possible diagnosis. But it all depends. Uh, I think it's a bad trend, but anyway, as it is a duty of our doctors to educate them, we spend more time with such patients, more time with such patients, explain. I have uh, tools with me showing them anatomy, explaining them the side effects, everything. Uh, and of course, as you rightly said, uh, we are doing muscle checkup for all of our employees. And uh, sometimes uh, all these checkups are life-saving. Uh, you know, renal cell carcinoma, single kidney. Uh, when we diagnose at muscle checkup, you remove them they does not require any chemotherapy or radiotherapy and their life is saved. So it requires proper counseling and education. And I think we have to change this trend of self-medication. Thanks, doctor. Thanks for the wonderful session, madam. Uh, and now 
we will move on to the second speaker uh, my friend uh, dr reginald george alex is an occupational health specialist he is a professor of medicine uh, from christian medical college vellore and uh, he has done mbbs and a diploma of national board in internal medicine and masters in physical health from singapore and he has also done clinical toxicology uh, and he is an uh, excellent doctor uh, who has taken plenty of uh, uh, academic sessions master of public health occupational health uh, in christian medical college which is regarded the highly reputed number 2 medical college in the country uh, and uh, he has worked through various levels of tutor the nursing professor now is elevated as a professor of general medicine uh, in christian medical college uh, and uh, he is and of course christian medical college has got a wonderful system of uh, staff clinic which takes care of all the uh, employees of uh, christian medical college special clinic hospital infection control committee protocols are driven even for my uh, iso audit purposes i have bought the manual of cmc i have in fact copied all the uh, protocols of cmc that is particularly the needle stick injury uh, if it is hepatitis b index case is positive hiv positive antiretroviral therapy uh, infection control chemicals modes protocols everything uh, it will be a very good book and over to dr reginald alex over to you doctor so my presentation is about, about uh, medication safety so i will be uh, if you talk about the medication safety uh, there is no end you, will, you can keep on talking about it so okay, um, as per dr kumaran's request i will be just talking about two two some, um, important subjects one is antibiotic antibiotic resistance and the other one is steroid abuse so to start with i would like to ask Uh, all of you one, one question how many of you have completed one course of antibiotics in your lifetime so this is a question i am uh, uh, i am leaving it to you please think about it honestly i have never completed one week of antibiotic in my life so <clears throat> this is a problem with even educated people even among the doctors community and uh, imagine among our common employees how bad it would be so why am i asking this question because this is one of the commonest reason for antibiotic resistance in the community so uh, i'll be briefly talking about antibiotic resistance why people are developing antibiotic resistance and why this is very important issue in the community so i will just briefly Uh, talk to you in another 10 minutes in simple terms because our employees have to understand that so once a body enters into your body you get infection and if there is indiscriminate use of antibiotics if the antibodies are not used at the proper dose or if the uh, the correct antibody is not antibiotic is not used you may end up having a super bacteria or super bug which may lead on to antibody resistance next slide please so this is the global burden of antibiotic resistance see the it is almost 1.4 million globally and if you see in the uh, south asia it's around 0.4 million next slide please so this slide is little crowded but what i am trying to uh, uh, tell from this slide is you see there are seven lack people are dying due to antibiotic resistance globally uh, per year and the world can expect to lose 100 trillion us dollars worth of economic um, output by 2050 so and if you see the uh, the antibiotic making companies so it was 18 companies which was producing antibiotics uh, in 1990 now it is only four according to this uh, data next slide so this is a resistant pattern we have seen in india so uh, it is quite alarming if you see for cephalosporin the common antibiotic which we use uh, we the, it is very high it is very pathetic to see cephalosporins they are ciprofloxacin and things like that 
they are uh, resistant in 3.5 billion kind of people and next is broad spectrum uh, penicillins and the least one is the aminoglycosides the gentamicin which people are not using commonly um so this is another slide which is showing uh, the the uh, proper antibiotic is used only in 10% of adults with uh, uh, pneumonia and the, uh, the, and if you see over 4% of uh, uh, over 4% of uh, uh, increase in antibiotic pre preparation in the last 14 years and uh, antibiotics percentage of antibiotics currently used in the food chain is around 10 76% Next slide. Right. So, what are the causes of antibiotic resistance in the community? So, the main thing is over prescription of antibiotics and the over the counter prescription. And the patient not, I told you already, patient not finishing their treatment uh, at the correct time. People are using it for a short time and just leaving it off. Then, overuse of antibiotics in livestock. So, uh, I'll tell you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later how this has been used and how the, it is harmful and poor infection controls uh, practices in the hospitals. So the many hospitals, they don't have a proper infection control practice, lack of hygiene and lack of new antibiotics being produced. So these are some of the causes of uh, uh, antibiotic resistance in the community. Next. Um, uh, and here, if you see more than half of antibiotic prescri uh, prescribing for selected events in hospitals were not consistent with recommended prescription practices. This is according to CDC criteria. Only half of people are correctly getting the antibiotics. And if you see on this side, 79% of the uh, patients, they don't, uh, um, they, they, their antibiotic of choice is not correct. And 77 of patients with urinary, urinary tract infections, the antibiotic of choice was not correct. Next. So how this uh, 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 bacteria, how the bacteria develops antibiotic resistance? One is just avoids the antibiotics. Second, it just distracts the drug molecules. And the third, evasion of the effects of antibiotics and restriction of the access of antibiotics then the, uh, when the bacteria themselves, they can modify the structure and characteristics of an antibiotic. Next. So this is an interesting slide, which uh, we should uh, see how antibiotic the, the resistance develops. It's, by, it's through both human and animals. Through humans, they take antibiotics. If they don't take it properly, they develop resistant strains inside the body, which they pass it on to their community people, the other people. And if they are admitted into a hospital, the other patients get similar resistant organisms. In the animal side, if you see, if they take uh, antibiotics, they may develop resistant strains in their body. Then people eat raw meat or uncooked meat or improperly cooked meat. Again, the antibiotic resistance goes into human being. And through their feces, it goes into the environment. And uh, uh, again, the, uh, it goes into the animals. So it's a vicious, vicious cycle. This is a very alarming uh, projection for the uh, mortality due to uh, drug resistant infection. If you see in 2050, 2050, 10 million people will die of antibiotic resistant infections. It's next to cancer and diabetes is next. The, uh, see the figures, 1.5 million due to diabetes Whereas antibiotic resistance, 10 million people may die due to drug resistance in 2050. Next. So what shall we do for this? How to prevent this? Unless we do certain things, this will end up in disaster. So there are few, uh, few, few um, uh, um, there are few plans, uh, there are few suggestions for preventing this. One is Enhance the inf uh, infection prevention control program. Control the source of infection. Prescribe antibiotics only if they are necessary. For example, during, you know, uh, someone was talking earlier, 
uh, antibiotics were rampantly used during the COVID period. Everybody knew that it was a viral infection, but unfortunately, um, the antibiotics were used left and right. That too, um, very, um, um, very superb antibiotics all have been used. Then prescribing appropriate antibiotics with inadequate dose. The adequate dose should be used. There are a lot of uh, sub-therapeutic uh, uh, regimens which have been used, which should be controlled. Which should be controlled. Uh, there was a study done in CMC some time ago. The, 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 there was 100 doctors for tuberculosis treatment, and they interviewed 100 doctors. And if you see the Throughout the world, there is only one regimen they are supposed to follow. But according to our study, we got 110 different prescriptions from these uh, 100 uh, uh, medical professionals. So uh, I think, you know, we have to educate our medical professionals also and education, educating our staff. And also another important thing is uh, uh, the culture and uh, the susceptible antibiotics should be given. Okay, what shall we do? This is an aware strategy. Uh, 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 A for access, WA for watch, and RE for reserve. So A means access. So these are some of the uh, antibiotics which we need to have. So for 25 common infections, we need to have these antibiotics. So uh, the common antibiotics, I'll... Uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll put up later, the, especially cephalosporins and all that, should be available, should be accessible. Watch. Watch is, these are the higher priority and the critically important antimicrobials, which should be used only if it is recommended. So watch for those things. And third is, these antibiotics should be used only if all the other antibiotics fail. So ACH, um, the, um, aware strategy, please Keep it in mind. So, uh, for example, next slide. For example, if there is an E. coli infection, you start with triaxone or cefepime or piptas. You start with that. Suppose if it is not, uh, there is the access. If it is not getting controlled, probably it is an extended spectrum beta lactamase resistant organism. So, you may have to go to the next step, the watch, the imipenems. So, uh, those are the antibiotics which should be used only if it is necessary. And finally, if all these things uh, fail, then go to the reserve, that is your cholestin and ticarsecin and all that. And the same way, methicillin resistant MRSA, again, you can usually you use with oxocillins, cloxocillins and all that. Then you go to vancomycin. And finally, if nothing works, then you go to the dapriomycin and all that. Next slide. This is, uh, I just uh, put one uh, slides on poultry antibiotic. There's a rampant use of uh, antibiotics among our poultry, especially in India. If you see this uh, slide, uh, India, the last one, see, almost resistant to all the organisms, all the organisms, the resistant strains can be seen in almost all the antibiotics. And uh, if you see the poultry use, the broiler use among uh, the Indians are quite high compared to other uh, countries. So that's the reason why even in the animals, the resistance strains are quite high. That's why the indirect cause for antibiotic resistance among uh, human beings. Next. So, uh, uh, so again, I, uh, as I told you, compared to 2013, in 2030, there will be doubled the the increase in antibiotic use among animals will be doubled in India. 2013 and 2030, if you compare, it is almost doubled. Okay, next. All right, uh, that's about antibiotic resistance. I, um, I'll, I'll just quickly tell about steroids. Steroid abuse is quite common in our community nowadays. And uh, if you see this slide, the anabolic steroids are used by the um, uh, middle and high school students in the U.S., quite high. Okay, next. So these are the indications for steroid use, only these conditions. Uh, for ex example, if the steroid level in the blood is low, then you can use it. Other diseases like arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma. Asthma also you cannot use regularly. 
let the, especially oral uh, steroids we have to use inhaled steroids and iv steroids only if it is severe and other diseases like inflammatory bowel disease only with doc doctor's prescription you should use all these things and uh, certain dermatological conditions organ transplant so these are some of the conditions where steroids is indicated otherwise steroids should not be used for uh, any other conditions next and uh, the, what are we doing now the steroid misuse is quite rampant in uh, following condition whenever there is anybody with uh, 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 musculoskeletal pain anybody with the aches and pains the uh, people give steroids especially if you get uh, drugs from over the counter they definitely give steroids arthritis it is not at all necessary people get immediate relief so people just give for uh, 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 give steroids except rheumatoid arthritis or sld all common arthritis especially osteoarthritis never give steroids never use steroids and uh, uh, for asthma and copd this again i told you asthma and copd there are certain indications for steroids not all people need steroids for these conditions so unless your doctor prescribe please don't ever take steroids some people will take prescription and then never go to doctors they keep on taking steroids because they feel very comfortable and uh, uh, because of that they keep continuing the uh, uh, and uh, steroids then common fevers i have seen people getting steroids for even for small viral fevers even for mild fevers people get steroids especially if they are getting it from the medical shop so please avoid that steroid is not at all indicated and it is very harmful in those condition and certain skin problems any allergy people just take a uh, uh, steroids because they get immediate relief so because of that they uh, they abuse steroids so these are some of the conditions which you should not use steroids unless your doctor prescribe and uh, these are some of the adverse effects if you see this man head to foot he has all sorts of problems because of the steroids so i don't uh, have time to go into details of everything uh, the most important things are you become obese you put on so much weight with steroids your face become pushing out you develop diabetes and hypertension and you have a lot of skin issues because of that and uh, uh, you get frequent in infections because the, your immunity goes down and because of that the, uh, the, you get frequent infections especially respiratory tract infections and urinary tract infections next uh, these are the this are some of the list i have put down you uh, you can read it later because of no time thank you so much thank you yeah. for the opportunity thank you thank you thank you dr alex uh even the steroid use is uh, because of patient's pressure patient require wants a quick relief and an instant relief that is a many practitioners are all being pressurized to use but of course uh, there should be a rational and an uh, ethical use of uh, steroids particularly as the indications you have said for those clear cut indications it should be used judiciously even in asthma micrograms is better than a milligram and today uh, the national list of essential medicines has brought in 384 drugs uh, which was released today uh, by the uh, parliamentary committee and uh, uh, in a, there is a nlem national list of essential medicines and um, in fact uh, all these drugs which are included in the nlem will be coming under uh, np pa national pharmaceutical pricing authority so they will bring in the price control maybe we can another four five months back after later uh, we can uh, expect a price decrease particularly in anti infectives like amikacin mupirocin meropenem and ivermectin and of course uh, very good news for uh, chronic ailments patients like diabetes because many drugs anti tendinitis uh, wonderful molecule Uh, that's also come under uh, NPPA National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority bracket. So all these uh, drugs which are going to cost less for the benefit of the patient, it's a good news. Um, and uh, particularly cancer patients, the anti-cancer drugs, including insulin, glargine is coming under NPPA, and uh, uh, contraceptives, uh, fludrocortisone, or meloxifen. all these are coming under uh, national list of essential medicines and npps bringing 
under that bracket. So good news for chronic ailments, particularly uh, cancer patients and uh, uh, diabetic patients, and commonly used uh, antibiotic, anti-infectives are also coming under the NLEM. Uh, it's good. So judicious use, uh, proper indication, contraindication, everything has to be taken into account. Then only it will be judicious. And uh, thanks for uh, highlighting all this in your uh, wonderful presentation, Dr. Alex. It's a pleasure introducing Professor Dr. Sandeep N. Mudaliyar, Senior Principal Scientist, CSIR, CFTRI. CFTRI is Central Food Technological Research Institute, Mysore. He was also associated with NIRI and guides doctorate students in the Academy of Scientific and Industrial Research. He has close to 82 publications to his credit with expertise on algae-based carbon dioxide sequestration, bioconversion on food and fuel grade products, crop residue and food waste vaporization, membrane bioreactors, ozonization for grain production with CFD, development of cleaner and greener processing methods in of nutraceutical with phytonutrients. You take rainbow colored fruits and uh, vegetables, you can avoid rainbow colored tablets. So rainbow diet, it's called rainbow diet. Uh, in fact, when spirulina was launched with this biotechnology, uh, 10 grams of spirulina equals 1000 kgs of assorted fruits and vegetables. This algae, it's a blue-green algae, seaweed. It was processed and it's been converted as phytonutrient capsules. They say 10 kg equals, 100 kg equals 1000 kgs of fruits and vegetables. So let us listen to Professor and, uh, and his uh, topic of uh, discussion is impact on environment. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. So my background is I am basically a chemical biochemical engineer. I started in a lot of pharma companies uh, for, for pharmaceutical products, antibiotics and all uh, uh, like Biocon, uh, Praj Industries, Copron and all. Then I shifted to environment. Then I am most now into food institute. So I belong to CSIR. Uh, you may be aware of ICMR. So there are clusters of laboratory under ministry of science and technology. So this issue was my passion because I was seeing a lot of uh, uh, issues of malnutrition because we also work with JSS Medical College on malnutrition. We run some program on malnutrition in the remote districts of Karnataka with Jindal Foundation. So, and also because of some personal health issues, uh, I thought there are ways and means to address this problem and how to avoid some unknown risk which is uh, growing exponentially day by day. So this uh, is nothing but the excess use of pharmaceuticals in general and personal care products in particular, what type of impact it can bring to the human chain because the whole role of a healthy society is you should have a healthy lifestyle. It can be enabled by multiple features so like technology, comforts, pharmaceuticals, good medical facilities. But what I felt is unknown risks which are entering the food chain because you are consuming food at least three times a day. So ultimately these pharmaceuticals, ultimately uh, along with personal care products which are using, they land up in the environment. And India being a water scarce country, the risk of uptake in the plants finally through soil and water is a high risk. So this I wanted to highlight. So this sustainable development goals, I don't want to emphasize much. So these are some, these are all the latest slides. These are some pesticides uh, at the Food Research Institute. We also have the export lab where we test various samples for pesticides. So the, uh, this, uh, because excess of pharmaceutical either by subscription or by indirect means. So this is some pesticides which were detected recently. I don't want to overemphasize on this. These are indirectly through personal care products which you are using for hair, skin, other applications. So I don't because of our limited time, this can also some it will land finally in water, sewage, 
so in india you you may be aware that less than 20% of the sewage which is the carrier of excess pharmaceutical uh, whole idea was lot of speakers emphasized uh, the the role of over use of pharmaceutical and antimicrobial resistance so we also have a program on antimicrobial resistant detection uh, bacteria and microbes in wastewater samples for department biotechnology so the whole idea was where it is coming and how to take care because something is unavoidable next slide so this also so the emerging micro pollutant pharmaceuticals and personal care products it is uh, abbreviated as ppcps this is a uh, buzzword today next next so you can see uh, madam last slide you can see the various steroids and other pharmaceutical personal care products so these are emergently detected in human sewage either human sewage and used in veterinary practices so these are the emerging pollutant detected all this is international scenario and also for the last 5 to 10 years because research is very scarce in this direction next slide please so this is how ultimately it will land up in the food chain uh, whether it is antibiotic personal care products pharmaceutical products uh, so this will land in the food chain next so this is one of the linking of excessive use and other chemicals over use in orissa this is the latest finding next this is the detection in river waters so the permitted limit is 0.5 ppb you can see it is detected in thousands so the whole idea is this water is used for irrigation so it will penetrate the soil and it will be uptaken in the plants and the food material next slide next next slide so this is only one study where indian data is there for anti inflammatory drug you can see india is above 100 nanogram per liter level okay next so i have indicated all the pharmaceutical this is one eye opener study this came in 2013 where unlike india where most of the sewage is not treated even in the best treated country close to 100% the conventional sewage treatment plants are unable to treat emerging pharmaceuticals i highlighted and other micro pollutants and 66 micro pollutants mostly from pharmaceuticals and personal care products you can see lot of pharma is detected so in india this op this opens a huge pandora's box what has to be done next this is only one study this also was detected because of lot of complaints of the pollution in the soil and nearby water bodies near the pharma hub of hyderabad okay so you can see the value of antibiotics and other pharmaceutical compounds it is 10000 times higher okay so the one of the reasons i don't want to disclose or open forum why lot of potential plants are shifting to other places okay so what is the solution you cannot stop this is some data how what is the potential of accumulation in the human chain especially through foods next these are the various plants where these pharmaceutical compounds can be accumulated next this is the uptake potential so there is sufficient evidence to prove that it will be uptaken to a sufficient extent in plant only based on the compound it may be low moderate high next this i will skip because this is more on the pesticide use how you can substitute with greener pesticides next uh these are some studies where this representative carbazepine is used for i think it is a brain drug then there are anti inflammatory how this is accumulated in various plants next this is also one emerging chemical which is used for disinfection and unfortunately it was banned in 2017 but in india it still continues to be used in hospitals also people are using this 
so my only recommendation is there when you are using uh, ethanol don't take any chemical ethanol plus triclosan so whether it is toothpaste soaps it is all banned so now a lot of hospitals are using this next this is the accumulation potential of the selective pharmaceutical in various plants are indicated this is radish bulb and leaf next this is in various parts of the plants pharmaceutical compounds next carbazepine has very high potential of accumulation in carrot some numbers i will give you if you consume a soil grown with carbazepine if you consume 60 gram of carrot carbazepine can accumulate in carrot this is the potato leaves next slide is all the in the plants next next slide what is the solution to this next next slide this is various parts of the plant this is the toxicity index for various pharmaceutical compound how much percentage of daily uptake if soil has this next slides this also risk assessment data is there next slide so in india in the since sewage is treated to less than 25% there is a high risk of accumulation of this pharmaceuticals and personal care products in the soil and thereby in plants edible plants next slide so what happens you cannot do so what to do so today i am actually at a pharmaceutical industry in bangalore i don't want to name it it is a renowned uh, pharmaceutical company so they are putting our technology okay uh, so for that i had come to bangalore so we developed this technology and this is released in the market on may 11 how to treat residual pharmaceutical compounds personal care products pesticides and also how to enhance the existing etp stp problems in existing pharmaceutical industries in particular we are also giving this technology for other companies also but since this is mostly pharma audience next slide next slide next slide next slide straight away we'll go to the technology next slide next slide so this tells you how pharmaceutical compounds can be degraded so the principle is chemistry wise you can degrade by putting a radical which has the highest oxidation potential now this radical can be achieved by various means okay so this is a technology csr has developed okay so i represent council of scientific and industrial research next so this is the potential of ozonation to degrade lot of pharmaceutical compounds next next i will ah so this is the technology which was released on may 11 that day being the technology day and we have scaled up this technology first in our own institute because we are using lot of pharmaceutical compound pesticide we have 45 accredited pesticide testing in drinking water at the institute so we have dosed our etp with all pesticides and pharmaceutical compounds so this technology we have released it next next so this is how it can be used to integrate in the existing etps stps of existing industry we have tested for all the pesticides and antibiotics we are recognized for 45 pesticide and 12 antibiotics in drinking water as per the food safety standards next 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 so this also we are now transferring to to apartment complex because people in the in karnataka the scenario is apartment has to draw the same water ground water and treat it and recycle their own so people are using excess pharmaceutical compounds so in 3 to 4 year cycle the ground water may have residual pharmaceutical compound because the same water is getting recycled so number of people are same so daily what enters the compound it has to be there only in the drinking water so this has some costing so if even one apartment pays 5000 one time fee the cost of the technology is covered next this is one trial we took for a contaminated borewell water from a distillery next 
so this is about my institute it is one of the laboratories under csir uh, we have a famous uh, pharmaceutical laboratory indian institute of chemical technology hyderabad and central drug drug research institute at chandigarh so these are our competence to monitor the various uh, pesticide antibiotics in food and water matrix next uh, this we are also pro, uh, doing lot of training holistic understanding of life cycle assessment we have a toxicity databases for any product food product pharma product we are doing this life cycle assessment next so these are also we have to publish because we are a scientific community a lot of publications have come so it is proved in the literature so these are some publications next slide so with with this i thank you okay so only i want to tell ki my interest came because i was in the pharma companies doing drug development then i went down to food and my only personal health issues told me that at least till 50 you should have minimum use of drugs okay so uh, and uh, mysore being the yoga capital of india so a lot of that inspiration also came so life takes you to different paths okay so uh, now we are also working with ayurvedic companies for liver health we have some icmr projects also on liver health so we are working with jss medical college also so with this few words i have one second thank thank you all for the opportunity yeah thank, thank you, you prof sir thank you prof sir sandeep uh, you have highlighted the unseen and unheard portion of the pharmaceutical side and uh, personal care products because if you see the latest is 10000 standards for drinking water analysis we test around 100 parameters like uh, uh, the ph then the turbidity uh, then uh, the hardness and all this aspect it contains as we said more than 45 to 50 components of the 100 test parameter uh, is mostly pesticides only uh, so much of chemicals we have generating and that is going and in, uh, affecting the environment uh, the future uh, generation will be affected because of the uh, environmental contamination actually thanks for highlighting all this wonderful uh, aspects so we'll move on to the fourth speaker uh, it's a pleasure introducing Uh, Mr. Sini Vasulu Metapalli, head of IPDO BU Global SHC, she safety, health, and environment. He is a result-driven professional with 23 experience, years of experience in the areas of environment, health, and safety and sustainability. He has M Tech qualification to his credit in the field of environmental engineering, and he has also done MSc in environment. He is a certified lead auditor for the Environmental Management System, Occupational Health and Safety Management System, Energy Management System, and Social Accountability Management System. And he has worked in several other pharma companies. To mention a few, are Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, GSK, Biocon, Hetero, Hikel, and he is also a certified coach for the well-being from the Art of Living Voluntary Organization. Uh, sir we would like to hear your presentation and also give some valuable inputs about the well being because now in corporates they all talk about wellness corporate wellness wellness index dimensions of wellness uh, they all follow whether it is social wellness psychological wellness uh, uh, physical wellness uh, so they give index each department will have how much or each individual how much does he score in each dimensions of wellness then wherever he is lacking he has to improve that actually that itself is a separate topic and it's a 2 3 hours long discussion okay. but being a certified coach for well being maybe a few 2 3 minutes of your value addition on wellness will be useful for our participants over to you sir uh, we are eager to listen to you yeah thank you kumaran thank you very much for giving opportunity and uh, introduced me so good uh, good evening everybody just uh, i don't want to introduce myself just i will skip going to the the topic uh, which is uh, green chemistry the green chemistry the way to protect our planet is our motto it's a pharmaceutical industry we are into pharmaceutical industry 
so unless until establish this green chemistry we cannot uh, uh, protect our planet that's what i believe and dr reddy's believe in it so that's our tagline is good health can't wait so the, what exactly the meaning of green chemistry is the design development and implementation of chemical processes or chemical products to reduce or eliminate use of hazardous waste or toxic chemicals so in a nutshell we can say that the green chemistry focuses on using the safer solvents some safer chemicals and using the renewables and we will increase the atomic efficiency that means the one at whatever the raw material is being taken that entire raw material has to be consumed by reduce the waste which is being generated and which will in turn the pollute the our planet this is the objective of green chemistry so this is basically talk about there are 12 elements in it so i don't want to talk about all the 12 elements that i will focus on the elements which are uh, basically into key elements which are this prevention and atomic economy and the uses of safer chemical synthesis and safe chemical design these are the major things what we need to focus with respect to the pharmaceutical industry where here this i will i would like to explain about how green chemistry works the first of all green chemistry is one patented molecule has been developed by the innovator at the same time there's the different companies will develop the generic model of the same molecule see in dr reddy's we will take the molecules we will identify the key molecules which are there in the market that which need to be taken to the large number of people on the planet so that molecules will be identified and the identified molecules will be developed in our r and d center that is called integrated product development organization what we call it here in that organization we will develop different synthetic routes for a single molecule under that single molecule the different synthetic routes which synthetic route is giving the less hazardous waste at the same time the high economy atomic efficiency that we will take it up those thing that synthetic route will be identified it will be taken for the further production of those development of that molecule once the development of molecule has happened then again there will be a possibility of scale up increase in the hazardous waste then again we will put up a continuous improvement program for the particular product so where we can improve the efficiency of the atom atom efficiency at the same time using the low toxicity solvents and low waste reduction these are the major aspects what we are considering as after development and going to the bigger scale region then even after that then the the second aspect is the first aspect is developing the molecule innovator molecule into green green aspects the second is enzymatic process the whatever the product api which has been identified the r and d team will work on that api can be developed through enzymatic enzymatic process that means developing the enzymes then extract the api from the enzymes by avoiding the chemical synthesis this is the hybrid model for developing the api the third aspect what uh, dr reddy is into it the biologics where we can directly manufacture the develop the biological uh, molecules through biologics process this is entire process is called as a green chemistry one synthetic route to hybrid route then hybrid route to complete to going into the biologic route this is the way dr reddy is working then which will increase the um the cleaner productivity at all the levels so uh, after this we we are going to develop this process at various stages and going for the different type of clinical trials at the laboratory level after that it will go to the higher levels so here in this green chemistry what i explained about the three aspects under one aspect where high amount of waste is being generated in the 
API generation in synthetic route. There we are focusing on people, technology, and the process. Where people, we are, we are having a very uh, systematic trained scientist to develop the process, robust process to develop with a green chemistry aspect by considering those 12 aspects of that particular green chemistry. Then we adopt the batch process or the flow or hybrid approach for safe and robust manufacturability. That is very, very important aspect when the continuous process, if you define the wastages and the water usage will be reduced, so it will move towards the greener product. Then comes to the process as I explained, this reaction mass efficiency, process mass index, atomic efficiency, reducing the waste water and reducing the uh, hazardous waste and the major aspect is genotoxic impurities. And we are going for the greener chemistry so that the impurities which are coming on synthetic road will be reduced in the green chemistry. So the, why, why it is happening? There are impurities which are coming along with the API where some of the hazardous chemicals are being uh, introduced into that so that that impurities may harm to the patient when they are using. In that way, when we develop the green chemistry, the impurity profile will be changed, then which is help for the people who are working, uh, you taking those products. Then the focus on green chemistry principle, these are the major three aspects what we are having. Maximize the resource efficiency, eliminate and minimize the hazards of the pollution and design system holistically by using the life cycle thinking. That means some of the products where we are generating the waste, the waste can be recycled or reused some other purpose so that the load on the environment will get reduced. This is the way the green chemistry will help the people to, uh, uh, the is helping the patients to be safer at these levels. So these are the just a matrix, this, uh, how the green chemistry works. I don't think it's, uh, we don't have much time to explain about this. Just I'm skipping this slide. Then at the same time, there is a limitation for the green chemistry. In this, the green chemistry implementation is high. It is having a high implementation cost because development of green chemistry molecules is going to be higher cost. And there is a lack of information about this green chemistry is a second challenge in the green chemistry implementation. There is no alternative chemicals or raw material inputs which are available. And there is no known alternative process technologies also available. So at the same time, once you are working on these aspects, there is an uncertainty about this performance. So all these are the limitations when the doctorate is we are working effectively to overcome these limitations to generate the green molecules for the future generations. So that is the process has been started at doctorate is where synthetic process in increasing the efficiency of the synthetic process, then enzymatic process of developing the API molecule and completely pure biologics. This is the way we are growing towards the green chemistry and keeping the environment safer for the next future generations. So that's all from my side. Then before closing this, just I would like to add, uh, as uh, Kumaran has explained, uh, the way of living style. See, basically the people are getting strained. So many toxic materials are entering into our body through the food, through the air. And even we are generating because of the stress and anger or negative emotions, we are generating different toxins. The biochemical reaction is happening and the toxins are generating in our body where it is accumulated inside and it is creating a health problems for us. That's what we need to work how to eliminate the toxins from the body on day-to-day -day basis. That's what, when you do practice different kind of yoga, meditation, and other exercise and mind management techniques, which will help you to reduce the load on your body on the toxic material. At the same time, you will be the energetic, the energy will be boosted up automatically. You will be healthy forever. So my sincere suggestion is we need to work on our energy to boost and remove these toxins from our body 
by various techniques, ancient techniques like uh, yoga, meditation, exercise, and the mind management techniques, which will help us to remove the toxins from our body and keep us healthier to avoid usage of the these all pharmaceutical products into our body. That is going to the much more preventive medicine than using the API medicines into our body. So thank you, Kumaranji, giving this. Yeah, thank you. Time thank you. Me. As you rightly said, sir. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the chronic stress leads to the effect on the immune system, where your natural fighting power against infection is also depressed, actually. And maybe uh, frequent meditation, 10 minutes, at least 10 to 15 minutes of meditation, morning and evening really rejuvenates your brain and improves your brain chemicals and makes you more energetic. It was a wonderful session with all the four speakers. Uh, and uh, uh, to start with, uh, uh, Madam Kiran Adi uh, explained the uh, human perspective uh, and the employees' industrial experience. Regional Alex gave a wonderful session on antibiotic uh, misuse as well as steroid abuses. Uh, because the problem is with the patients, they don't complete the course. They don't, when they go to the medical shop also, they don't buy the full course of antibiotics. If the doctor prescribes for five days, they buy for a couple of days or three days, or even if they buy for five days, if they become all right, for in two days, then they stop the medication. And if family members have similar illness, the balance three days medication is being again given for two days. This is how the cycle is uh, going on. Uh, it's a real problem. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, it's doing more harm than good uh, by antibiotic resistance. And as uh, Dr. Alex pointed out about, about the anabolic steroid misuse, uh, people now uh, people want to have good bulky muscles, short span of time. Uh, so much of sales of whey protein powders uh, and anabolic steroids and injections by younger generation does not require the supervision of a doctor at all, uh, all over the counter. Uh, or the person's uh, fitness trainers themselves give all these prescriptions, uh, which is not at all recommended. It's a bad trend. Mm, and of course, universal metabolism. Uh, sir, uh, one question about uh, green chemistry is there. Uh, yeah. Now, there are many companies, since you have a good background with pharmaceutical industry, many people, many pharmaceuticals are pumped in money into research, innovation, and they found out a new molecule, new pathway. Uh, and uh, new technology, uh, they come out with an innovative, excellent molecule with uh, quality, efficacy, and safety of the molecule. But exactly. how long do they retain the patency? And at what time they give it to other pharmaceutical companies for manufacturing similar molecules? No, basically, patent expiry will be around uh, 10 years like that. It will be there. It mm. depends upon the people will apply for it. Then okay. what will happen, all these uh, other generic people, they mm. will identify the molecules which are very good molecules in the market, mm. which are already having a patent. Those mm. molecules will be developed with a different kind of synthetic roots at their particular uh, own innovative centers. Mm. Then they will execute the trials with the different uh, people. Mm. Then it will be ready when the patent of that particular molecule expires, then these people will enter into the market with uh, high efficacy and low toxic material because innovator will not much see those aspects because mm. he wanted to innovate the molecule. Whereas mm. the other uh, generic people, they would like to see the uh, green chemistry aspects in each and every molecule what they are developing because they are having a laser time to develop okay, then, okay. Uh, they wanted to develop at a lower price because okay. this uh, innovator doesn't look for the profits automatically it will come whereas the generic players they wanted to enter in the market with lesser price they okay. plays a role to uh, moving towards the lesser and less cost uh, mole molecules are being developed with the uh, non-toxic chemicals sometimes. That's what it will happen. Okay, okay. And one more thing, I think the entire, uh, for, for, this is a uh, one more uh, concept which we failed to discuss, the entire panel members, we have not, uh, have not brought up this issue uh, about the human clinical trials of the newly uh, discovered molecules, ethical issues. Uh, because generally with animal studies, it is there. 
but uh, when uh, the new drug being uh, discovered and being subject humans are subjected to phase 3 phase 4 clinical trials the ethical issues just a thought process um, i think definitely uh, in human trial if it is harmful then we will be failing in our ethical norms actually but of course human trials are also having adverse effects of new molecules which the employees face with the employee i mean uh, human space no basically what will happen uh, the uh, extensive studies are being conducted on the animals okay. so whatever the adverse effects most 99.99% of the adverse effects will be visible in the animals because okay. the similarity will be there the same kind of complete study will be carried out on the animals even animal ethical uh, things are being followed it's not that simply we can use the animals for the testing there is a ethical okay. committee which approves which kind of animals need to be used for the particular molecule thus mm-hmm. that and all will be there with the external agencies will be there they will sit and they finalize the animals with what need to be done what need to be verified so mm-hmm. extensive study will be carried out after that only once it is success then only they will come to us. so that is the reason 99.999% molecules are success once it is come to the 4 and 5 Only one or two molecules fails because of unforeseen conditions or unforeseen conditions with respect to the ecological or geographies. That's what okay. place it was. Good. Thanks. Thanks for highlighting, uh, Professor. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm Susan Roberts here. We yeah. serve yeah. a public of uh, the Adivasi community in which we are using in our hospital generic medicine, sir. And um, in that, we don't see... If if i have to take the generic medicine that medicine doesn't work on me is there any specific reason for that because generic medicine they say is very good as i have also heard from the others who are speaking saying that generic medicines will act slowly or sometimes the molecules are missing so is it helpful to go for generic or is it uh, what we are using uh, regularly with the uh, with all the toxic material that is better can you just share your knowledge on that because i don't understand why does generic medicine don't act on uh, some of the patients like me also yeah basically there will not be any medicine it is not like generic will not work so definitely the whatever the molecule which is being developed by the innovator same will be developed and then the same replica will be done that with a different synthetic road so this is only the myth uh, saying that generic mil- medicine will not work the the only one issue what we could see the generic medicine who is manufacturing that plays a role sometimes because there are so many uh, small uh, little companies which are there in the market if those medicines which are coming for uh, which they will not follow the uh, proper quality parameters and during the manufacturing as well as the during the analysis and all those molecules generally tend to uh, um, tend to not to work on the people like you are somebody else saying but if you go to the re- renowned generic manufacturer definitely there will not be any issue that i'm not supposed to say that but this is the one of the underlying reason which some of the generic molecules are not working on the patients uh, so then how do we come to know that which company is having a genuine generic uh, compositions in the medications uh, can we why no, don't no, they no, publicize no. those no, names no, rather rather than naming uh, mr srinivasulu there is a Uh, concept of uh, uh, this uh, drug assays actually when you do a drug assay test we find how much is the active ingredient percentage availability so that will reveal the quality of the drug madam so we okay. do not want to name anybody uh, yeah. but the best way is you do a pharmaco the pharmacokinetic assay or a, whatever the, the assay of the particular active ingredient if it is around uh, accepted standards are 94 to 96% sir yes. mrs universal sir yeah, yeah, yeah. so if it is around 94 yes. to 96% active ingredient then it's not it is the effective molecule yeah mm-hmm. yeah next uh, we'll take up next question we'll shall we take up next question 
Thank you, sir. That, sir, I Thank think. You. Uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, to add to that, I think uh, what my I would suggest to Madam is that probably you could, uh, uh, if you find something of such instances, they should probably, or if they are uh, suspecting such kind of thing, the probably the the best thing they could do is to uh, contact their ne nearest uh, academic institution and uh, go for a BAB studies as a, as a studies. So that, that thing would be probably the best uh, way out. Yes, yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful replies. I'll take a quick feedback from Mr. Mukul, who yeah. organized all their employees across their regional offices to attend this program. So I just so, want to hear from him. How was this experience? Yeah. And uh, thanks for organizing this wonderful session, Asich. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the panelists and uh, Kirti, Shobna, and Dr. Pomeran for you know uh, moderating this, and I think it has been a wonderful session and uh, very insightful, very very insightful. You know, uh, I mean, I'm responsible for 4,000 people here, but I think, you know, in the interest of uh, ensuring that you know we provide the maximum benefits to our people, we end up you know, maybe you know doing something which probably, in which we you know which ideally we should have not been doing, right? So, however, with this session, I mean, we also get to understand that yes, probably you know. Uh, Consuming generic medicine just like that is not something which is which we should encourage as such, you know, you know, with our employees or as such, we should not be keeping it with us. And probably we need to create a little more awareness within our organization, first of all. Secondly, uh, you know, I think uh, as an organization, also we are very cognizant of this fact that yes, you know, people should, you know, people must take the right advice from the right people, right doctors rather. And then probably consume anything or maybe take any action. So for that, you know, we also have tied up with the MediBuddy as well. You know, post pandemic, we have tied up with MediBuddy as a you know as a partner, wherein you know the employees you know generally connects with uh, consults with a doctor online. It's a free of cost service for all our employees, and then only probably they try and you know whatever the doctor recommends, a qualified doctor recommends, then only they consume this uh, you know their medicines. But I think it has been been an eye opener for us because generally you know our medicines like you know, Dolo or maybe NSN or very, very generic, you know, OTC medicines, which we generally, you know, encourage people to take. I think it is, you know, this session uh, will, it will really help us in ensuring that at least we keep a check on whatever we do, you know, whatever we encourage people to take. As such. So thanks a lot uh, to all of you and for providing such an insightful session and uh, special thanks to, again, you know, Girti, uh, you know, for organizing this and Dr. Kumran for wonderful moderation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, to add to whatever Ms. Mukul has said, uh, any doctor-patient consultation is never over without past history, history of presenting illness, family <clears throat> history, uh, and of course, uh, clinical signs, clinical examination, uh, investigation support if necessary. Uh, that is the 360-degree approach to correctly diagnose and then give the treatment and the drugs of choice. And it is essential for the physician to understand what is the indication of the drug? What is the contraindication? What is the side effect of the drug? Right. Spend some time with the patient to explain about the side effects of the drug also. And, uh, uh, and no harm to the patient uh, because the cost, not the, not the cost, the risk and the benefit ratio as, uh, as always to be assessed and the benefit as to outweigh the risk. Only then the medicine has to be prescribed. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mukul, for your... Thank, thank you, Mr. Nice Kamran. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Once again, dear panelist and moderator, uh, it was a wonderful session. And as the saying goes, prevention is better than cure. And leading by example, Dr. Kumarin, your anecdotes and facts were mind-blowing and helped us to stay connected with a plethora of information given to us by our panelists. I think we have come a full circle since yesterday. Yesterday in our institutional web webinar, Dr. Pari was telling that self-medication, over-the-counter medication is very much prevalent in medical college students. Today, our panelist, Ms. Kiran Aidi, pointed out certain prevailing practices like self-medication, over-the-counter medication due to factors like no time or like, you know, availability of Google doctor. So it is very much the need of the hour to create awareness on their ill effects, irrespective of whether it is an industry or an institution. And then over to Mr. Srinivasu Matlapalli, the, your gyan on green chemistry and its impact on our environment and future generation was mind blowing, sir. Green chemistry has become the mantra for sustainable lifestyle, which is a precursor for achieving environmental well being and healthy living. 
Dr. Alex, your thoughts on antibiotic resistance and the anabolic steroid abuse due to various reasons like overprescription, over the counter, non judicial use of such drugs in animal husbandry, or like, you know, the choice of very bad lifestyle. I think it's a vicious cycle which needs to be broken to reduce mortality. To prevent this and enhance, in, uh, to prevent this, we need to enhance our infection control program, educate our patients who we prescribe through a stewardship program and create an aware strategy for the health professional who is prescribing it. Professor Dr. Sandeep, I think it's the second time I'm hearing to all your uh, like, you know, thoughts on your micropollutants which get into our system from personal care, pesticides, from pharma and other industry. The amount of data we saw was mind blowing, but scary. So now is the time to act before it is too late. But not, but like, you know, as everything is said, it's not only the duty of the healthcare professional to police medication safety, but every citizen or individual is responsible for safe medication practices within their family and in the larger community. So we hope this webinar gave the information and resources necessary to do so. On this note, I would like to thank our sponsors, Zunavish HR Consultant, which is, who is focused on serving comprehensive need of human resource and business needs in the full range of employee and business life cycle, as well as our other sponsor, CJ Darcel Logistic Limited. We would also like to thank IOCL Madhya Pradesh State Office, Indigeni, Denso 10 Minda, who made arrangements to communicate the program with their employees and contract partners. We would like to thank the CAHO leadership team for their undeterred support, our extended CAHO family, as well as CAHO secretariat for their assistance. We would like to thank all the participants who took time off to listen to the webinar. Last but not the least, Kirti Disauza for organizing the panelists for a constant support and encouragement without which I think the program today would not have happened. Thank you everyone.